In the name of the Father who created us, the Son who redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit who sanctified us. Amen. In God's name we begin. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, every day we sin and fail to do God's will. Let us humble ourselves now and confess our sinfulness before God, our merciful Father, and before one another. Lord, loving Father, we come before you to confess that we are sinful and unable to free ourselves from the chains of sin. At times we are thoughtless and thankless, proud and impatient, faithless and fearful. We spend so much time worrying and concentrating on our own needs and our own problems. We spend so little time praising you and helping others. We sin in what we think, what we say, what we do, and what we don't do. Forgive us our sins and free us from guilt for Jesus' sake, who died that we might live forever. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God the Father, our refuge and strength, give your people courage to faithfully share the gospel even in times of persecution. Teach us to pray like Jesus, who asks that your will be done rather than his own, and grant that the courageous witness of your people would be used to bring many to faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Our first reading for today comes from Acts chapter 21, and this is also our sermon text for today. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board, and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die, to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Manasseh, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel text for today comes from Luke chapter 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. 
On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Ready? Or, or not. When we're kids, we like that phrase because it means we're about to play a game. We're going to play hide and seek, and we're going to go hide, and it's a kind of a thrill when the person counts, and then they say, ready or not, here I come. But you know when you get older, it kind of loses the fun. You get in, into school, and you realize, oh, my gosh, I've got that algebra test today. I am not ready. That's not so fun, is it? Or you get even older and, and you're in college or maybe at your first job and there's either a, a final and it's going to determine 70% of your grade or your supervisor says, hey, I need that information first thing in the morning and they say that at 4.15 in the afternoon. Ready or not? And too often it's not. And I would submit to you that for many believers, we find ourselves kind of in that situation when it comes to witnessing, which is silly and sad because that's one of the main reasons uh, for our existence on the planet if jesus didn't need us to witness he might bring us to faith and we just disappear like that and be with the lord but that's not how it works peter writes in first peter chapter three always be ready to give anyone uh, an answer who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have always be ready and are we ready for that? Especially when it's difficult. That's what we're going to be looking at today as we go through Acts chapter 21, a few of the verses at least, because Paul is ready to go to Jerusalem. He says that, and his friends are not ready for him to go to Jerusalem because that means arrest, and they are fearful that it might mean his death as well. And so it's a good time for us to think about our own readiness to serve God. Am I ready? to give witness to him. And well, sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. Am I ready to face hostility like the Apostle Paul did? Am I ready to maybe uh, get some guff on my Facebook page or more personally when I'm face to face with some relatives or friends? Am I, am I ready for that? And am I ready to make sacrifices so that the kingdom of God could grow? Am I ready to sacrifice my money, my time, my energy, my abilities? Am I ready to do that or not. Well, the first believers that we're looking at today are ones from 2,000 years ago, Paul's friends. They're on the end of their third mission, or Paul's third missionary journey, and he's in a hurry. He wants to get to Pentecost, or to Jerusalem, for the annual festival of Pentecost. It was one of the, the big three festivals that they had. And so we've heard them travel the last couple of chapters, we hear those little cities they're going through today, but now they're getting close. And Paul receives two warnings. The first one is in verse 4. We're told that they found the disciples there in Tyre and stayed there seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Now, this doesn't mean that the Spirit was urging them to urge Paul not to go. What this means is the Spirit was revealing to Paul and the others that trouble lay ahead. In fact, Paul says that earlier. He says, the Holy Spirit's telling me wherever I go, I'm going to face persecution and attacks and so on. And the disciples interpreted that to mean that Paul shouldn't go. They weren't really seeing the big picture, were they? Because when you read the whole of Scripture, there are times when God allows his people to suffer 
not because he enjoys their suffering or wants them to suffer, but because he works really good stuff through that. He does great things. And they weren't seeing that. All they could see was danger for Paul, and they urged him not to go to Jerusalem. So that's the first warning. Uh, the second one comes in verses 10 to 11, and it's this prophet named Agabus who comes down from Judea. And here's what he said. He, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. That's a warning, isn't it? Now, I, I want you to think about what that would mean in the context of the times. We read that and we go, oh, you know, you might, you might get imprisoned in Jerusalem. That would be a bummer. But, but notice the words that Agabus says. They will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. You know else, where else that language is used? It's used in the Gospels. It's used by Jesus. Three times in Mark and Matthew, and I think in Luke as well, uh, Jesus predicts his own death. For example, he takes uh, his best three friends, Peter, James, and John, and he goes up high on a mountain, and he's transfigured before them. It, he, he becomes glowing white. Uh, his glory is shining. He's talking with Moses and Elijah. It's a mind-blowing experience. But then when they come down off the mountain, Jesus says, the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and he will be killed, and on the third day rise again. And so Jesus uses the very same language. And you have to know by this time now, uh, maybe 20 years later or so, uh, 15, 20 years later, that people know those stories. They're, the Gospels are being written. People know what Jesus said. The disciples said, yeah, he predicted his death several times. Over and over he told us he will be handed over to the Gentiles. So what Agabus says here, it, it rings pretty powerfully in the ears of those disciples. And this is one of the reasons well, that they didn't want him to go. And so they pleaded with him not to go. Verse 4, through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Verse 12, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. No, don't do it. How do you uh, respond when you get those little warning voices in your head? Do you have that, that one relative? I had one of those relatives. We, we used to have big family reunions on my mom's side. My mom was one of 11 children. Great respect for my grandmother. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I remember one of our reunions, we had 70 people there. You know, and, and I don't know if some of you have much larger families, but to me that was big. And, and, and there, was, there was one person who was like, yeah, don't know why you guys are, you know, into going to church on Sunday. Do you have someone like that in your family? Many of us do. Maybe it's a friend. Every time you post a Bible verse on Facebook, they post something opposite. We don't like that. I don't like it. And so when we get those little warning voices, like don't go there, don't, don't say that, don't do that, it's kind of easy to give in to fear, isn't it? And this can even happen uh, in a restaurant. We were eating at a restaurant last night, and I was all set to pray for our server, but, you know, he came and dropped the food off and left so fast. It's like, what happened? At least that's what I'm telling myself. But there was a part of me that was a little anxious about it. Why? Because I'm a sinner. And when we get these warnings, um, we're often not ready for that. And, and it's silly because Jesus told us this is exactly how it is. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their crosses daily, and follow me. It's not like it's a surprise. <laughs> Remember what the cross was? That was the lethal injection of the day or the electric chair? We don't hear that very well, but that's what Jesus was saying. If you want to follow me, it might mean your death. I'm not promising you anything easy. Your life might go smoothly, but it might not. No guarantees. 
you know, Pastor Kyle and I are so blessed to be doing ministry in this era. We have health coverage. You know, Jesus didn't say, if anyone would come after me, um, let them apply for the 401k and make sure they turn in their W-4 form and uh, your health coverage will start at the beginning of next month. <laughs> he did not say that. He said, hey, get in line, there's your cross. It's not that he doesn't love us. Jesus doesn't want us to suffer, but it may be necessary. Now, I do want to say, it's not more noble or more Christian to suffer. It doesn't make you a better Christian de facto. And so don't go out seeking suffering. You know, you might smile, but there are some Christians I've known who do that. They want to suffer because then they feel kind of legitimized. Don't need to do that. But if God allows it, then that's okay because he has the big picture in mind. So let's think a little bit this morning. Can you think of any time in the Bible when God used suffering to accomplish something good? I know you can't speak, but right? All we have to do is look at the cross. Unfair suffering. A man in his early 30s never committed a crime, much less even broke one of God's laws. He was railroaded by an illegal trial and put into the hands of the Roman governor, and he was executed. There's nothing good about that from our perspective. But God used it to save billions from hell. And the count is ongoing. That's really awesome. And we can think of many others as well. Think of Job in the Old Testament. He was a man who suffered terribly, afflicted by Satan under God's hand. And Job never finds out, as far as we know from the text, why all these things happen to him. God does not explain it. That's totally unfair, right? And yet, the book of Job has helped millions and millions of people to deal with their own suffering as they see how in the end God is merciful and gracious. So how can we be ready? How, well, we can look at Paul. How is Paul ready? He says in verse 13, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He was ready for whatever may come his way. Why? How could he be ready? Was Paul some incredibly gifted person who had things that we don't have? Was Paul's character so amazingly profound and deep that, you know, he would meditate for hours and then, you know, he had something we don't? Not at all. Remember who Paul used to be? He used to be Saul. Saul, the persecutor of the ancient church. Saul, who caused the death of believers. He was not a good guy. So how could he be ready now for such an amazing change? Well, he was ready because Jesus had been ready. Did Jesus get warnings of what was going to happen? Yeah. Even at age 12, when he was in the temple in Jerusalem and his parents couldn't find him, when they eventually caught up to him, he said, hey, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Even at age 12, he knows that he has work to do. As God, he always knew it, but as a human being, he grew into that. And as I said, he predicted numerous times what would happen to him. He was going to Jerusalem to die and then to rise. So he had ample warnings. And he had friends who pleaded with him not to do this. So I told you about the, the, the transfiguration of it, right? And Jesus is glowing. He shows his glory. He comes down off the mountain. And, and during that same time, about that same time, he asks his disciples, so who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? Well, Peter, being the kind of the big mouth guy that he was, he got it right. At first, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that's when Jesus said, yeah, yeah, you're right. And we're going up to Jerusalem, and the son of man's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles. He will die in their eyes. Do you remember what Peter said then? This shall never happen to you, Lord. 
Why did he say that? Because he loved Jesus. He absolutely loved him. And the idea of Jesus being executed was horrific to him. And he said, no, no way. You can understand that. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. That's a Greek way of saying, get out of my face. I want to see you right now. And Jesus said to Peter, you have in mind the things of men, not the things of God. You're getting this all wrong. You don't see the big picture. This suffering is necessary. And I'm ready for it. And so Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knelt there and prayed. It says he fell on his face. If possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. But not my will be done, yours be done. Jesus said, I'm ready, Father. I don't want to do it, but if this is the only way to save people, I'll do it. I'm ready. And so Jesus died. He carried the sins of the world to a cross and died there and rose from the dead. Paul knew that was for him. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes about this to his friend Timothy. And here's what he says about himself and his experience. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. See, he wasn't a good guy, was he? Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul realized he was not a good guy. He had done some evil things. He had caused the death of Christians before Jesus set him straight. He knew that he was nobody special, but he knew that Jesus was special. And he knew that Jesus was ready to die and rise again for the sins of the world, including his own. And that's why Paul could say, I'm ready to be bound. I'm ready to die in Jerusalem, whatever, whatever it takes. I know my Savior. I know the one who died and rose for me. I know that if I die, that's not the end. And so I'm ready. And that, my friends, is the key. Do you find yourself fearful of witnessing for Jesus? Do you find yourself anxious when you might have to talk to someone or, or you're having a little keyboard conversation? How can you be ready for that? You do what Paul did. You recognize that, that you're not a good person on your own. I'm not a good person. On my own, I'm not. But Jesus is a great savior. And on your own, you are not good people. But Jesus is a great savior. And when you recognize that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had not just Paul in mind, but also you. When you recognize that he went to a cross for you, all your blunders and mistakes and the hurt you've caused other people, he died for Remember, Paul said, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Think of what you've done in your past. Jesus died for those sins. They're paid for. They're done with. And he lives to make you ready to follow his will. To go where you need to go to say the things that need to be said, even if they're risky. Because he'll be there. He doesn't promise us an easy life. It may be a cross. But he does promise eternal life. And nobody can take that away from us. And so that is why we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Jesus teaches us to pray as he prayed, Father, your will be done. And the hope that we have then 
is something we can share with others. Jeff, would you go over to the light switches over there and turn off all the lights? I want to end the sermon today with a video. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. God, our provider, we thank you that you continue to give us our daily bread and supply our needs in so many ways. We thank you for those whose jobs have not been threatened, who are healthy, and who have stable income. We are grateful that El Dorado County continues to be very healthy overall and ask your continued care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, you obeyed the will of your Father and suffered and died for your people. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice. And we ask that you would give us the courage to follow your example and make sacrifices for the sake of others. Bring your healing to all who cry out to you, especially Victor Morris, Donna Meyer, Monica schultz Kluing, Marilyn Brown, Mary Ann Andrila, and Millie Anderson. We pray for those who are weighed down by anxiety and depression. And we ask your strength for the family and friends of Pierre Chevalier who died this past week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, continue to give your protection to those who are fighting wildfires and to those who are endangered by them. Look with mercy upon our nation and lead us to love each other as you love us. Open our eyes to the truth that all people are created in your image and deserve respect and justice. Watch over those who serve in law enforcement and help them to do their jobs with integrity and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of kings and Lord of lords, you have provided the governing authorities for the benefit of all people. Give your guidance to candidates and voters that our nation would be blessed and protected during this time of national and local elections. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. 
With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night on which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, drink. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This too is often to drink in remembrance of you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. 
Shed for you. This is the very blood of Christ to shed for you. This is the very blood of Christ shed for you. Now may his true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you from your body and soul to life everlasting. We part in peace. Amen.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast mercy lasts forever and ever. The Lord is great. He deserves high praise. His greatness is unsearchable. Those of one age will praise to the next what you have done, O Lord, and will tell about your mighty acts. I will praise you highly, my God and King, and bless your name forever. I will think of the splendid glory of your majesty and the wonderful things you have done. I will praise you forever. The blessing of our almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remain with you now and always. Amen.